My name is Cecil Pearson, Jr. And for you to understand the things that I'm about to tell you, I'm going to have to take you back a little ways. But I promise not to keep you there too long. When I was 12 years old, my dad carried me to the Fort Sheard Hospital because I was sick and was bruising real bad. And uh, they told my dad that I had leukemia and that I was going to die. And they gave him some medicine to help me not hurt. And, uh, well, I kind of half figured, you know, they would, uh, uh, overdose me and put me out of it. Well, they got back home and it's about 2.30 in the morning. My dad asked me, he said, before I give you this medicine, boys, is there anything you want? I said, yeah, I'd like Grandma Root to come down here and pray for me if, if you don't mind. And uh, my mama put up a little fuss because it was 2.30 in the morning. But Daddy said, hush, woman, call her. Well, she called Grandma, and Grandma come down, and she uh, lay hands on me, and she started praying. I had a real high fever. And she started speaking in tongues, and I went to sleep. Well, before she got done praying, according to my mom and dad, my fever broke. And the next morning, Daddy come back there, and he woke me up, and he says, hey, boy. How you feeling this morning? I says, Dad, I feel fine. I'm just real thirsty. He says, I'll get you a glass of tea. And he went and got me a glass of tea, and I drank it. And I had been real sick, so I was throwing it up, everything I drank and eat up. And I, I, I said, Dad, I'm, I'm still thirsty. I want some more tea. And he went and got me some another glass of tea, and he gave it to me. And I drank it. And he goes, Why don't you get up and get dressed? We're going to go down to Fort Stewart Hospital, and I'm going to have them test you again. So we went down there to Fort Stewart, and uh, they checked me, and they couldn't find a single cell of leukemia anywhere in my body. And the doctors told my dad, and I don't know what makes doctors think it, but they do believe that that little curtain that they pull around your bed is soundproof. It's not. You can hear the bad news, and you can hear the good news right through that curtain, docs. We can hear you. <laughs> little humor for that. But it's not a magic curtain, I promise. And I heard the doctor tell my daddy, he says, well, we must have made a mistake, sir, because uh, there's no sign of leukemia anywhere. He goes, no, you didn't make a mistake. He had it. But God cured him of it last night. And the doctor says, well, I don't believe in God. And the doctor said, you didn't need to. He did. And he carried me home. Well, actually, we, we didn't go home. I don't want to tell you anything that was wrong. We went straight to the bowling alley where my daddy bought me as many hamburgers as I could eat. And we bowled a whole day. He carried me back to the house. And uh, I started going to church right regular. And, excuse me, my nose is running. And he carried me. I started going back to church. And uh, before I realized what was happening, I started playing piano for a couple of girls at the church. And we traveled all over southeast Georgia playing gospel sayings. And I believed in God. And I knew that he had worked a miracle for me. And I believed in the devil. I, I did. I won't lie about it. I believed in it. But I never did really buy into all the hocus pocus of you got to pray and you got to ask for forgiveness and stuff like this. I just never bought into it. Even though I sat up there and I played music for girls to sing about it and I seen people worshiping God and getting saved left, right, and center, I just never bought into it. Well, May the 1st, 1985, I woke up and my pillow was covered in blood. My right ear was bleeding. Now I've been sick with my ears for off and on for my whole life. I'm deaf as a post in it now. But uh, Dad gathered me up and he carried me back down to the Fort Stewart Hospital. They ran some tests and said, oh no, we can't take care of this here. He's got to go see a hospital. He got to go to a hospital a little further south. Now I'm not giving names because I don't want the doctors aggravated. Okay, they're old now, like me. Well, long story short, May the 2nd, 1985, about 8.15 in the morning, I went in for emergency surgery. I had a huge tumor in my middle inner ear on the right side. They did something called a right radical mastoidectomy with a tympanograph. Now, for you folks that don't know what that means, is they went in and they cut the tumor out, 
and then they grafted me a new eardrum. Well, the tumor, when they got in there, had eaten through the skull cavity, or the skull, and into the skull cavity, and had gotten on a little bit of the brain in there. So they called in a neurosurgeon to come in and take care of that. Brain surgeon, you know. Do a little brain surgery on me. <sighs> I'm still a pretty smart feller. Well, sometime during that surgery, my heart stopped. And I was clinically dead for 38 minutes. And that's what this is about. I told you I never bought into the hocus pocus. So you'll know to my surprise when a staircase appeared to my right of where I was laying. And there was angels on that staircase on both sides and a figure came down the center of it. And that figure was Jesus. He looked a little bit like a picture that we had in our church, but his hair wasn't long. It was it was very short and curly. And his beard was, was very well trimmed and just nice looking, nice looking man he was. And I knew it was Jesus because I could see the scars in his hands when he took me by my hand and lifted me up out of my body. And we started walking up these stairs and seemed like every stair we every step we took, the faster we went. And before I realized that we were moving faster than anything I'd ever seen. And I was flying over this meadow, this, this green meadow, and I could smell honey and fresh bread so strong. And I was taken and stood in front of this big gold door. Now the door was so wide that I could look to either side and I could not see the sides of it. Standing on the floor or the ground or whatever it was I was standing on. It was gold, I can tell you that. But it was transparent. So pure it was transparent. That when I looked up, I could not see the top of the door. From standing on the ground looking straight up, I could not see the top of this door. But there was a handle on it. And I grabbed this handle and I tried to pull it and open it. And I couldn't open it. It was too heavy. I couldn't move it. Well, all of a sudden, this door just flew open by itself, and this intense light poured out of it. The light was so bright that when I covered my face and I buried my face against what my feet were standing on and tried to just shield myself from this light and this pain that the light brought, that I could still see the light. It was like a, it, it, I could see the bones in my hands kind of light. Well, I heard these words, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I have never known you. And in an instant, an angel on my left and an angel on my right jerked me up out of there, and the peace that I was feeling while I was there was just destroyed. And they carried me across this dark chasm and just dropped me. And I fell for what seemed like an extremely long time, and then I hit. And when I hit, there was a searing pain in my body. It was like every bone in my body broke, but not a single one did. It was dark, but you could see. The stench was so bad, it smelled like rotten flesh. That buzzards that ate on the side of the road. Some of them, it would smell as if the buzzard wouldn't even eat it. And the heat and the fire was so hot that it was transparent. It was invisible. You couldn't see the fire. But the, hot, the fire was so hot that you could feel the skin bubbling up and running off of you and your flesh just melting and hanging off your bones. But when you looked down, there wasn't nothing wrong with it. So it could keep burning and you could keep feeling that sensation all the time. And there was no relief from it. And I wasn't standing on the floor. It was people, other people. And these people were clawing at my legs and biting at my feet and my legs, trying to pull themselves out from under the people that was on top of them. And the whole time, people are being dropped in from above. It's like nobody's making it into heaven. I know that there were some folks getting in, but not nearly as many as you'd think. Because there was a lot of them going into hell. And then all of a sudden, every single time that God had presented himself to me in church, that I had felt the Holy Spirit tug at my heart 
and try to draw me up to the front to the altar to get saved. Every single time the Lord had dealt with me started playing like a bad movie. Over and over and over in my head, I could see it over and over again. I could hear the Holy Spirit calling me. Well, I made my way over to the side and I tried to climb out. And the walls were real high. And it was like it was moving. But when I finally made it to the wall and I got up away from the things, the, the people that were biting and clawing at me, I, I didn't have that going on at the moment. The heat was still there, but then all of a sudden this demon, this huge, huge demon, the thing must have been 30 feet tall, cracked me with a whip, crossed my back, felt like it was going to split me in half and knocked me right off the wall, right back down into the pit. And folks, it was awful. It's screaming and crying and biting and clawing and burning and seeing this bad movie in my head and then all of a sudden I could hear it off in the distance. I could hear a voice, Father, please let me go get him. Let me go get him. I know he'll change, Father. I know he'll do what we need him to do. God, just please, Father, let me go get him. And then all of a sudden this light started coming from toward heaven because you can see heaven from hell. You can see it. You can see what you're missing out on, which makes it that much worse. And this light starts coming from heaven, and I mean it's coming at a quick pace. And just before I went under, I raised my hand up, and Jesus pulled me out of that pit. Demons were screaming. Uh, the, the souls that were there in hell were screaming. Everything was screaming and getting out of his way because, well, he's the boss. And he took me up, and over that green meadow we went again. We was moving faster and faster and faster, back the same way we come. We got back down to the operating room, and I was standing there beside Jesus. And I could see the doctors doing CPR on my body. My daddy was standing there in the room, had his pocket knife out. And he told that doctor, he says, I swear to God, if my boy dies, so do you, so you best keep working. That was my daddy. Well, Jesus picked me up, and I could feel so much love, so much love from him. And he laid me down on myself, putting me back in my body, I guess. And he kissed me on my cheek. And he told me, go tell the world what you have seen. Tell everybody who will listen. Now go and do our Father's work. Go. Two days later, I woke up in intensive care unit. My dad was right there by my bed, and the first thing I said was, Daddy, get me to preacher. He said, uh, okay. Well, he went and he got a Catholic priest was there at the hospital, and he come in the room, and I told the priest everything that I've just told you, and a whole lot more in greater detail. But for video's sake, we're just cutting it kind of short. Well... The priest said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, you were dreaming, um, this kind of stuff don't happen, and I, I, I run him off. So I told Daddy, I said, Daddy, you got to get me to preacher from our church. Now, I'm not going to tell you his name, and I'm not going to tell you what church. Well, a couple hours later, he showed up, and uh, I told him what I'm telling you. And he said, now, Cecil... You know, when when your heart stops and when you're under the anesthesia, chemicals get released into your brain, and you can see all kinds of things. And I just, this don't happen. This, this, this didn't happen to you. This is not real. It was a dream. It was your mind playing tricks on you. Well, I run him off, too. And Daddy said, what now? I said, get me Grandma Ruth. Well, he got me Grandma Ruth. And she come in, and I told her, and before I could get done telling her, she was shouting and speaking in tongues and th giving God all the glory and the praise and the honor and the thanks. And she looked around at me and she said, Now, Jody, see, I used to be Joseph before I changed my name to Cecil. And uh, she said, Now, Jody, what you want to do about it? And I said, Grandma, I want to get saved. 
She said, them's the sweetest words I ever heard. Let's pray. Let's pray right now. And we did. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And when I left that hospital, I did not leave the hospital the same man I did as I went in that hospital. But folks, I want you to know, every single person I told about this laughed at me. They made fun of me. They mocked me. They made jokes about the big bandage that I had to wear on my head. I mean, everybody made fun of me. Very few people believed it. My daddy believed it. My mama believed it. My grandma believed it. But other than that, I'm not quite certain anybody else believed it. I really ain't. Now about... Sorry. About three and a half weeks ago, I lost my wife. And she'd been after me to record this. And I told her, I said, honey, people will make fun of me. They'll laugh at me. They'll think I'm lying. They'll mock me just like they used to. And she said, don't matter what they do. You need to record this. You need to put it on YouTube and get it over to Facebook and every other place you can put it. So you can warn folks about what's coming. You can tell people that heaven and hell is real. They need to know. I didn't do it for her, but I'm doing it now. Because she's in heaven right now. And in order for me to get there, I got to do what God asked me to do. And that was tell everybody. So that's what I'm doing. If you want me, I am a licensed minister, folks. If you want me to come to your church and talk to you about what I saw and the experience I had and give you my full testimony, I'll be more than happy to. All you got to do is contact me. My contact information will be down below. But folks, don't think for a second that heaven and hell ain't real because it is. There's very real consequences for the things that you do while you're here on this planet. Very real consequences. You can think I'm joking. You can think I'm lying. But I'm telling you, when your name is called, and you hear those words, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, you can't say you wasn't warned if you watched this video, because you were. And you're going to find out exactly what I'm telling you is waiting for you in hell. Now, folks, the word hell cannot be big enough to encompass the terror and the horror that is there. Just like the word heaven is nowhere near big enough to describe for you the wonder, the beauty, and the splendor and the peace that waits for you if you've done what God has asked you to do. And it's real simple. It's real simple. It's not complicated. Confess your sins to God. Confess your sins to God. Ask for forgiveness through the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then get up and live by the example that Jesus set for us. That's just how simple it is. It's not hard. Folks make it harder than it is because they think everything's got to be about me, 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 me. Folks, it ain't about you. It's about what God wants from you. This video's been long, too long in the making. Long, too long in the making. So take it from a fella who's been there. I don't have to go by faith. I know it's there because I've been there. Don't make the same mistake I did.